Hey, this is Pastor Josh. Just want to thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. And if you really enjoy these videos, please don't forget to subscribe below. God bless you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today in our Bibles. Matthew chapter 5. We'll be in one other text in 1 Corinthians. The title of the message today is Shining for the Glory of God. Shining for the Glory of God. Shining bright like a diamond, but for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Not the glory of self, the glory of God. Let me ask you this question. What is the point of life? Why are we alive? What is the purpose? Why do we live? Why do we live each day? And it's very easy to answer short-term perspective. Well, I live to be happy and to um, enjoy life. This is a short-term goal that everyone has in front of them and everyone is pursuing. Um, You wake up each day and you put your shoes on and you go to work and you make money and uh, you have different ways of pursuing life or different things that you do. But what is the point in each of them? And ultimately, it's leading to somewhat of a happiness for yourself, right? But when you keep doing this over and over for 80 years or 90 years, and then you look back on life, you say, what was the point of that whole thing? Like, what was it? What was the main point for human beings? What are we doing here on this earth? We're like a bunch of ants just running around the earth, just doing a bunch of stuff to try to make ourselves happy. What is the point of this whole game? What's the purpose? I have to know because if I don't, I'm going to completely miss it and find myself at the end of my life thinking, what did I just do for 80 years, 90 years, 100 years? What did I just do? And how have I wasted time? And oh, I never really knew the ultimate goal and purpose. We got a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world right now, huh? Yeah, we were, I was just talking with one of the church members about it uh, before service, about how we're, Katie and I, we go on vacation, it's our sixth year anniversary, praise God, we're married and we love each other and we're on vacay, but I'm looking back at the United States and we're seeing all this crazy stuff going on. Turn on the news, CNN and other countries, and you see hurricanes, right? We have hurricanes in two states there and wiping out uh, f- part of Florida there, and then down the Caribbean, the islands down south, uh, St. Thomas and St. John, the Virgin Islands, and and then you see earthquakes in Mexico, or an earthquake there, then you see fires on the west coast, and then you see wars uh, being with North Korea, and, uh, or with North Korea, and, and and I'm thinking like, thinking back even on our country and all the issues that we're going through with race and with money. And, and, and just the political things, and I'm thinking, like, what is going on here? And we get sometimes so focused on these very surface uh, things that are happening in front of us from day to day that we forget the long-term goal and we completely miss the point of why we are here. What is the point? What box do we have to check at the end of our life and say, completed? Because we're pursuing a lot of them. And our society is convincing one another that there are a lot of boxes to be checked that we have to do, and many times we miss the mark completely. Um, We were in Greece, and we were walking on the street here last week, and as we walk by, I'm wearing a hat. You wouldn't recognize me on the street because I don't exactly dress this way, but uh, many of you laugh at that because you see me outside of this place. but I try to dress up a little bit for you guys. You know, I want to look clean, you know, look nice. But um, I'm wearing my flat bill hat, and, uh, and there's a big emblem on the front of it that says obey. And I walk up to this guy, and I, uh, he, he's trying to sell stuff, and he walks up, and he sees it on my hat, and he says, obey. He says, oh, what do you obey? Because if you look at the emblem of the obey symbol, it's a lot of, like, anti-government propaganda, all of this kind of stuff. And... Uh, and it's there on the symbol. It's just a, a company of uh, clothes I like to wear. But uh, I'm look, he's looking at it closely. He's like, what's obey? And, uh, and then he says, and I tell him, he says, well, who do you obey? 
And I said, wrong question, buddy. <laughs> In my heart, I said, I obey Christ. He looks at me like, what? And then my wife's standing next to me, and yeah, we're on vacation. I said, I obey Christ. And we're in the Greek islands there, and um, the nation of Greece is basically Christian Greek Orthodox, you know. He knows what I said exactly. He says, oh, what do you mean obey? I said, I obey. I follow his commands. I walk with them. Jesus said, and I looked at him, I said, Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commands. He's like, huh? He says, it's not a burden for me to obey God's commands. I love doing it because it blesses me. The burdens of God are not, a bless, are not a curse, but a blessing. Psalm 19 tells us that. And I start to show him Psalm 19 and exposit it for him there. And then he starts to tell me some of his philosophies and some of his truth. And he's a spiritual guy, and, and he likes just listening to people. And he wants to tell me all of his insight and all the different spiritual things that he's discovered. And I looked at him, I said, his name's Nicholas. After St. Nicholas, who basically helped found Christianity in that part of the, the world. And uh, I said, Nicholas, uh, how do you know any of that is true? And why do you believe it? He's like, well, is anything true? I said, that's a great question. I said, you know, Jesus was asked that same question 2,000 years ago. You know what they said to him? They said, hey, Jesus, how do we know what you say is true? And you know what he told them? He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. And they're like, the temple took 40 years to rebuild. How are you going to rebuild it in three days? He said, the temple he was speaking about was his own body. I said, Nicholas, you know what Jesus was saying? He said, you kill me and I will raise from the dead. And that's how I'll prove to you everything that I ever said was true. And after I said that, and I said, listen, Jesus is the only religious guru, the only religious philosophy, the only way of thinking on the face of the earth that said, I will prove it to be true by raising from the dead. Every single person on the earth is dead, except for Christ. He actually rose from the dead. And he looked me in the face. He says, I just got the goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Nicholas, you're made to worship God. You're made to be in a relationship with him. That's our purpose. That is the goal. But legacy, I know you have a problem, me too, of figuring out how that works out in your real day, every minute, day-to-day, moment-to-moment life. What does that look like in real time? I can come worship God on Sunday, but how do I do that with my whole life if that's what I'm made to do? We're going to look at that today. The whole goal and focus of Christianity is to worship God and invite others to worship him. That's it. To worship the Almighty and to invite the world to come and worship. When I'm on the streets of LA and I get into a spiritual conversation or I you know, invite somebody to church, you know, I got to slip the card to our uh, Lyft driver yesterday from the airport. You know, and uh, I just like telling people, come and worship. Come and worship. Come and worship. The human being somehow knows what that is. They, they get it. When I say come and worship, they, they know we don't worship human beings. They know we only worship gods. And so when I say come and worship at church, it clicks in them, even though, even if they don't know what true worship is. They were made to do this. Human beings are made to worship the Almighty. And so we are to be inviting others to worship God here in L.A., on the streets. You're talking with somebody. They talk about their problems and what's going on. Say, hey, man, you know you were made to worship. You should come and worship. I dare you. You should worship God with your whole life. And it will prove to be the very thing you were made to do and get this body and heart and mind to fire on all cylinders like you've never experienced before. Can I share a little story? I heard of a couple. They're in Minnesota. They decided to vacation to Florida during the winter. Right? They planned to stay at a very same hotel where they spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate their travel schedules. So the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday. His wife would fly down the following day, okay? The husband checked into the hotel, and there was a computer in his room, so he decided to send an email to his wife. However, 
he accidentally left out one letter in her email address, and without realizing his error, he sent the email to someone else. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned from her husband's funeral, and he was a minister of many years who was called home to glory after a sudden heart attack. The widow decided to check her email account, expecting messages from relatives and friends, and after reading the first email, she fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, To my loving wife. Subject, I've arrived. I know you're surprised to hear from me. <laughs> they have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. <laughs> I've just arrived and I've checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hoping your journey is not as uneventful as mine. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> That's just a joke. But life goes by fast, huh? Like the snap of a finger, like the blink of an eye. Young people, talk to older people. Listen to them. I dare you. A lot of young people don't want to listen to older people. You ever notice that? I ain't got time to listen to those stories. You fool. They're dumping wisdom, bags of gold upon you that you could never get except for failing as many times as they have. They're giving it to you for free. And if you listen, they'll teach you a lot about life. And they'll share with you a lot of things. Life is very short. Goes by very quickly. And you only get a certain amount of days. There's a bank account given to you called time, and you're withdrawing seconds from it every single day. And you only have a certain amount left, and one day, that account will be empty, and your day will be over, mine too. And so we want to spend that time wisely. Have fun. Go travel. Surf a couple waves. Enjoy the life given to you, but don't forget to worship God all the way through, amen? You see, it's not how, how long we live that matters, but how well we live. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger catechism, chapter one, or question number one reads, what is the chief and highest end of man? What is the chief and highest end of man? And the answer, I love it, a biblical answer, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. What does that mean? That's what we're looking at closely today. The simple focus of Christianity, my sole purpose in life is to lift up Jesus. And I'm telling you that you can do it in your Los Angeles world. You gotta think differently you got to start to see it each and every day. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read Jesus' red letters, his words. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. We always stand for the reading of God's word here at Legacy to pay honor to him because it's his words we're reading and not mine. So a lot of people want to argue with me about things, and I say, go argue with Jesus, you know, because he's the one who said it. Uh, those are his words, and if you want to get mad at him, that's fine. Um, if I am a jerk, get mad at me, but uh, I like to just lay it down and show it as Jesus says it, and we pay honor to him, to God's word, when we open it each and every week by standing as we read it. Matthew chapter 5, three verses today. Look at verse 14 in your text. Are you there? Jesus said, giving a sermon on the mount, to his disciples, his boys. He said, guys, gals, you are the light of the world. You are a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. 
He says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we act that all angles, all aspects of our life, somehow we would figure it out. We would bring you glory. Everything, Lord, from beginning to end. We would not walk out of this place, out of this life, without bringing you glory with our lives, making you famous, making you on the billboard, putting you on the throne. Lord, let our light, let our lives shine into the world so greatly they would actually see our good works and start worshiping you. Father, I pray for legacy that each of us would be able to figure out how that works in real time in our lives and exactly what we're doing today. Help us figure it out. We love you, Lord. We lift this time into your hands. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Jesus says you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And if you are that light, and if you are that city on that hill that can't be hidden, there is no way for us to hide this light. You are the light of the world. Soak this in for a second. If we were to call something the light of the world, we would probably say it is what? The sun? The sun is the light of the world, is it not? The sun gives light to this world, but Jesus says, no, not the sun. He says, you are the light of the world. That you are the one that illuminates this place. You are the one who brings light to it. You are what shines. You are what gives light to this dark world. It's in you. And then Jesus compares us to a city on a hill, not light from a city on a hill, but simply a city on a hill that can't be hidden. Who can hide a whole city? Anyone? I'm just going to throw a blanket over the city of L.A. I'm just going to hide it, you know. You're not hiding this city, especially a city elevated, a, a, a city that sits on a hill. Maybe a city in a valley can hide. Maybe someone can pull that off, but a city on the top of a hill, impossible. Jesus says, you, legacy, you, family, you, my friend, You are the actual light of the world that no one can hide and no one should hide ever. You don't hide this light. You don't hide this city. We are to be shining to bring light into the world. If you hide the sun from the earth, everything will die. Likewise, if we hide the light of the Christian, if we clothe it and we act like it's not there, if we're scared to shine light in places, Things will continue to die spiritually. Nothing will be illuminated. Nothing will be resurrected. Nothing will be raised to life. That's why Jesus says, you have to shine. you got to turn it on. you got to let it shine. Don't be weird. We don't need more weird Christians. Please, don't do that. But you know, you can smile at people. You know, you can love and serve people everywhere. And once you do, and they like, gosh, what in the world is so different about you? There's your opportunity. Or, you know, they're telling you about something bad, and you say, hey, man, can I pray for you? I'm a Christian. I found that the more that I share that here in L.A. is contrary to what is told to us, that the more that I share that here in L.A., the more people are ministered to by it. And what I'm saying is, is we may lose some opportunities, but man, I have gained so much. I think because people are looking for a breath of fresh air in people, and they're looking for a true light that shines from them, not a fake one, the genuine article. And when they come in contact with it, they don't care. When you're able to put aside religion and all the terrible things the church has done and just say, look at Jesus. Have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever read his teachings? Look at him. He's changed my life, and that's why I want to minister here in L.A. That's why we're here. That's why we left our home. 
We came here to shine Christ. Jesus takes it a step further. Verse 15, he says, Nor do they light a lamp, light a lamp, and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. These pictures are amazing. I love it. Jesus speaking in parables, giving us pictures to help us understand. He says, they don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. First, the basket's going to light on fire. That's not helpful. But second, what is the point of lighting the lamp? It would be like turning the lights on and then quickly throwing a blanket over it. It's like, why'd you do that? Exactly. It makes no sense whatsoever. The same is true for the Christian who tries to hide their light. Makes no sense. For why did Christ put a light in you for you to hide it? Nobody lights an oil lamp or a torch or a candle or a match to put it under a basket. Doesn't make sense. Jesus draws these pictures for us to show us how much it doesn't make sense for us not to be shining our light into the world. Every day. You know, you have the light living in you right now, and if you suppress that light, you're missing on what makes your heart beat. Our taxi driver yesterday, Albert, Lift, he picked us up. I didn't tell him I was a pastor, and he slowly uh, starts to tell me about Christ. It was awesome. And I watched him. I watched him lure me in. He's probably like in his 50s, maybe early 60s, and he's just a happy guy. He told me the story about how he wanted to kill himself 20 years ago because he was in some big investments with Russian mafia, and he lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, he was depressed. He was going to kill himself. And a pastor came over to his house and started loving on him and his wife and serving them. And he prayed for them. And he preached the gospel to them. And he repented and became a Christian and then started going to church. And, and here he is picking me up from LAX to take us back. And by the end of the trip, after he had very subtly worked in the gospel... And he even told me that you have, to, you have to confess that you're a sinner before God and that you need a Savior and you've got to repent and stop following all the other gods and turn to Christ with all of your heart. I'm looking at him like, gosh, Albert, I wish there was a hundred more of you in this town. We changed the whole place. And, uh, and so I waited all the way till the end when he's literally telling me, I love you guys, and I'm so thankful to you know, serve you and all this. I'm like, dude, it's just a lift ride, you know, like you're... And I paid him 28 bucks, you know, it's not a lot of money, you know, I'm just like, what, what, what is the deal? He loved on us for eternal gain. God had shined a light so brightly into his life, there was no way he was going to put a basket over it. Nope. And I gave him my card at the end. I said, thankful for you, Albert, thankful for people like you. Keep shining brightly. Shining for God's glory. A Christian who does not shine is an oxymoron. Wouldn't that be funny if you saw somebody walking around in the dark with a flashlight in their hands? It's turned on, but they have their hand over it. They're yelling, I can't see anything. I can't see. You got to take it off. We're Christians, man. We shine bright. We're, we're full of Christ. You know, we worship God. And then we go into the city and it's like, shh. I don't care that so many Christians have made a bad example in the city of what to do. We are here to make a good example. And I recognize that people are attracted to certain things about my personality or whatever it is, the way that God has built me the way that I dress, the way that I act, the way that I carry myself, whatever I do in this city. I can make friends pretty easily here in this city. But I remember telling myself this even back right out of high school. I said, look, whatever is attractive in my life, I'm going to use it for God's glory. I'm going to find a way. Because I always disconnected church and worshiping God from being in the world. I said, we do that. We worship God on Sunday. Then throughout the rest of the week, I don't do the worship thing. I work and I make money and I do life. But I never knew how to mix the two. I didn't know what it looked like until I started reading the scriptures. 
and I saw that we were called to shine all day, every day. And it doesn't mean being weird, and it doesn't mean quoting scripture all day, every day to people. No, I want to show you what it looks like. Look at verse 16. Are you ready? Jesus says, Jesus told you, he told me a command. Are you ready? Christian, Legacy City Church, people of God, sons and daughters of the Most High, you are commanded, let your light shine before people, before men and women, that they may see your good works And when they see them, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know what L.A. has told you? If you let people see your good works, they're not going to glorify God. If you let people see your good works, they're going to, you're going to lose that. You're going to mess everything up. You're going to miss out on this. They're convincing the church not to shine brightly. And then some are convincing to shine in such weird, awkward ways I think another use of the enemy, to destroy the church and to mess up its effectiveness. But we are called to shine brightly in exactly what we're doing today. Your personality, what you reflect, how you function, what you like to do, your choice of job, your choice of of pursuing life and what direction you want to pursue it. And exactly who you are, watch this, God has made you to glorify himself exactly the way that you are right now. You don't have to become a different personality. You don't have to change your occupation per se. God has called you in exactly where you are at to bring him glory. Let your light shine so bright that men would actually see your good works and praise God for how you live. Let me ask you this. Has anyone ever done that in your life? They see the way that you live so much that they fell down on their knees and they started worshiping God. Let your light so shine before men. They would see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Has it ever happened? Maybe we're not shining bright enough. The light is in there. You don't have to do much more. Just live as a Christian and it will actually start happening. We're going to look at details of what this looks like. You remember the Philippian jailer? Remember with the Apostle Paul? Remember Paul the Apostle, he's in prison? And an earthquake happens. And the doors fall off the jail. Like, all these dudes, murderers and thieves and all this stuff, are sitting in jail, in this cold jail cells. And Paul's just sitting there, and he's singing worship to the Lord. Just blessing the Lord in his cell. Praising God, singing to him. And all of a sudden, an earthquake happens, and the doors just fall off. And Paul's looking around, like, huh? All the prisoners are like, yeah, we're free. Let's get out of here. The Philippian jailer sees what's happening. He's like, oh, no, all these prisoners are going to get away. Caesar's going to have my head. I'm going to be dead big time. All my, there's no way I'm getting away with this. He pulls out his sword to kill himself. You know what Paul does? Paul stands up and says, hey, hey, hey. Hey, prisoners, everybody, settle down. Get back in your cell. Nobody's going anywhere. You know what the jailer does? He falls down on his knees and he says this, what must I do to be saved? He cries out, what must I do to be saved like you, Paul? I've never seen anything like it. You guys should have ran free. I was ready to kill myself. I've been a terrible guard. And here you are over here loving on all the other prisoners and worshiping God. And they listen to your command and they stay put. But me, they would have ran. You love me enough to make all these prisoners stay so that I don't kill myself. Amazing. Paul's face shined so greatly in a prison cell that it saved the guard. A Christian who doesn't shine is wasting God's power. Wasting. Wasting. Do you remember Acts chapter 1 verse 8? Jesus said this to his boys, hey guys, 
they were told there in Acts chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses to the world, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. You will be my witnesses when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my what? Witnesses. You know what a witness is? You get on a witness stand and you tell the truth about what you know and what you have heard. What do we know and what have we heard? We know Jesus and we have heard his word and it has changed our lives and we are to shine that truth into the world. We are to be witnesses everywhere that we go of what he has done. How much power do we have from the Holy Spirit? When the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. How much power is that? Are you ready? Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Is that crazy or what? The same Spirit, the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, the Bible tells us, and me. That's a lot of power, isn't it? That's a ton of power. To be a Christian and not a witness is not an option. To be a Christian and not a witness is not an option. You have Christ. He's victoriously saved the day so that you can shine. You've been given the power to be the light of the world. In modern terms, you have been given the backing of a nuclear power plant to shine a flashlight of your life. Behind you, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me hook up my little flashlight to a nuclear power plant and then shine that thing through your life. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to shine very much. And I'm kind of nervous about what they'll think. And, you know, is it even going to have any effect? You know, like, what, it, what is it going to do? You know, and God's like, what? Let your light, the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, shine into the world and they will worship your God who is in heaven. That is the game that the enemy is playing with you, trying to trick you into thinking that you have no light, you have no power, the Spirit of God does not live in you, and it's not effective. The fact of the matter is, it is. I could have walked past Nicholas on that street and said nothing to that guy about obey. But I knew that the Word of God would not return void. I knew that it would accomplish its purpose in that guy and that God would work in him. And I was telling Katie, I was like, you know, babe, I think this is one of the reasons we're in Greece. Not just because it's beautiful and because the food's great, but because God had sent us here to minister to that guy. And he'll probably never forget the day that he stopped that guy with an obey hat on, his, uh, obey hat on to tell him that he needs to obey Christ. That that is what he was made to do. The question is not, why don't we have as much power as we need? You have all the power that you need. A one-day-old Christian has all the power they need to point people to Christ. How do I know that? Do you remember the man plagued with legion, a thousand demons in him, who was in the caves there at Kersey? Do you remember him? He was naked and in chains and he was living up in the caves and he comes down to Jesus and, and here he is, demon-possessed man, and Jesus cast the demons into the pigs and they run off into the sea. He had been a Christian one day. You know what he did? He went back to his town. He told everyone of what Jesus had done and the town believed because he was clothed and he was in his right mind now and he was worshiping Jesus. I want to display practically how this works in your life. Are you ready? Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Turn over there and let's break this down. We know where to shine brightly, like a diamond. We know where to be effective in this world. We know we have the power to do it. We know what we're called to do. But what does it look like practically from day to day? How do I glorify God with my whole life, with all that he has called me to do individually, specifically, for your specific life? Here it is, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Look at verse 31 there. Are you there? 
Verse 31, are you there? It says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You see that? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Would you say that with me? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. One more time. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory. One more time. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory. One more time. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all. Just one more. Just one more, please. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Why you make us say that? I'm not going to say that. Because I want you to memorize it. And tonight when you lay your head on your pillow, you'll be like, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. You know. You've got it memorized, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Let's break it down. Let's exposit the text here. Whether you eat or drink, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth of what we're studying right now is writing a letter to them, helping them to understand eating and drinking even can be done to God's glory, the very basics of life. And they were missing it. They were out of line. And so he's correcting them in that. And he gives it to the whole of life. He says, whether you eat, let's break down the text here. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, very interesting word here in the Greek, it means eat. Eating food, yes, real, good, amazing food. I'm talking tacos, guacamole, and you know, I'm talking lasagna. Oh, praise God for lasagna. I'm talking about pastries, tiramisu, oh gosh. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, so good. Good barbecue, potatoes, vegetarians, I know the green stuff. It's stuff's pretty, it's kind of it's good. It's kind of good and stuff. No, I eat really clean during the week and then I party at night in my eating, you know, when I go out. Um, whether you eat... What, what is it saying here? Is Paul really saying eating? Yes, he's saying whether you eat real food, in and out burger. <laughs> Medici here on the corner here, Sherman Oaks, bomb pizza, bomb. Whether you eat or drink, very, very interesting word in the Greek. I've never seen it before. It means to drink. Yes, drink water. Yes, drink the basics. Yes, whether you eat the basics or drink the liquids, whether you eat or drink, and then he says this, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you do every day? What do you do? Identify it. This is who I am. This is what I do. Okay. Now he says, do it for the glory of God. Look, look at what Paul's doing. He takes the very basic necessities of life, eating and drinking. Might as well put breathing in there. Whether you eat or drink or breathe, and then whatever you do in life, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. This is huge, whatever you do. If you're fishing, driving, drinking coffee, watching TV, working, working a job, going to school, hanging out with friends, raising a family, finding a husband or wife, whether you're walking, talking, eating, or drinking, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. What do you think that word all means? All. All is for God's glory. Everything that we do. Paul is saying that our whole lives need to be an act of worship to God from the smallest things that we do to the greatest things. John Blankard said it this way, life ought not merely contain acts of worship, it should be an act of worship. The whole thing is an act of worship to God. You say, okay, I get it. Everything I do needs to be for God's glory, but I can't be a missionary and go live in another country and like give up my whole life for God. How do I do that in my day-to-day -day life? Well, let me tell you. Eating and drinking, you know you can do it for God's glory. Eating at a restaurant, you know, the waiter's looking down and bummed out today, and I like to do this sometimes. 
I'll put scripture on the receipt. With a smiley face, give them a nice tip, you know? Put Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. They're like, what is that? And they do a Google search. And then it says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Be gracious unto you. Shine his face towards you and give you peace. I like smiling at people. Because it infects them immediately. I noticed it on our trip in Europe. We're just like going around and people have these stone cold faces, especially in some of those countries. You know, it's just like very intimidating and scary. And then I just, you know, I'd, I'd smile, you know, real, buongiorno, you know, you know, like real big. And they'd be like, ah, you know, like the, all of a sudden, like they're, they're, they're with me, you know, like they're, you know, at Starbucks, you know, when you go to get your coffee, you know, you can look at the guy or girl over at the counter and just say, hey, Hey, don't work too hard, you know. May the Lord bless you today. You know, I know, I know you're carrying a lot. I can see the lines were long, you know, and just uh, take it easy, you know. Enjoy it today. I hope it does. You, you're doing a fantastic job, and I appreciate your service. You know you can do that? You know you can bless people in this city? Why not? You know what we're doing here in America is we are trying to pursue, and I know this is a touchy subject right now today of all things, but I've been talking about this for like a decade, but today it's a touchy subject of the American dream. And the American dream is something that the American people have propped up, one that which we say brings happiness, one that we say actually will fulfill the soul. But you and I know that even if you get it all, it doesn't satisfy. And I know that many of us are still, or many of yeah, us are still on the pursuit of this American dream and making money and buying a house and 2.5 kids and the SUV and, you know, uh, nice jeans and, you know, you want to live in that nice neighborhood and you want your kids to go to college and you want them to, you know, uh, grow up and, and, you know, pursue a life for themselves and establish it and become a grandparent and then, you know, retire at, you know, what is it, 64 and a half or whatever, or 65 and a half and get that 401k and, you know, and then, and then just live in bliss, right, and play golf for the rest of your life, right? I mean, that is the American dream, right? The problem is, is that so many people are still not satisfied at the end of it. And so I want you to watch and look very closely that, watch this, as you're on your journey, as you're on your journey through life, don't miss glorifying God and eating and drinking and whatever you do, doing it for God's glory. Are you ready? You know that in high school you can bring God glory by walking with him. I used to bring my Bible to school when I was 17. It used to cause so many crazy debates and all kinds of stuff in high school. It was an absolute blast. And I wasn't walking with the Lord most of my high school, but then at the end, I tried to start walking with Jesus. And I used to wear this jacket that said Jesus Christ on the back. I was so weird, you know, and it was just like people would yell in the halls like, Jesus, and I'd be like, yes, you know, and, uh, it was hilarious, and uh, no, but I, I was vice president of my school, and I played quarterback for my football team the first couple of years, and I had some influence in there, and I became friends with a lot of people there, and I started realizing that my role there in those days was just to try to turn people to Christ. That's what I was trying to do from the start there. And, and, and then into college years, I was thought, you know, people go to college to party, but how can you bring God glory in college? I'll never forget this one girl who tried to minister through, uh, through her uh, communications class. Yeah, that's what it was. It was communications class. And when you take a communications class, I think you have three speeches. You have an uh, informative speech, you have a demonstration speech, and you have a uh, persuasion speech, I believe. Yeah, and so... Um, I can't believe I even did this. Uh, my demonstration speech, I did a break dancing thing. I made everybody move all the chairs back, and I literally break danced in the middle of the, it was hilarious. I've, I don't even know why I did that. But uh, the informative speech was on Christianity, and the persuasive speech, you guessed it, was preaching the gospel. And so the room got so tight, and my teacher told me, she's looking at me, she says, uh, your time's up, Mr. Thompson. I'm like, no, no, I have a timer right here. I'm good. You know, I'm still going. And she was so angry with me. She gave me an F on the speech. And uh, yeah, because I was persuading the crowd. And uh, they, she didn't like it. But it was for God's glory. I remember one girl did a demonstration on how to study the Bible in her classroom. Amazing. Giving glory to God just in where they're at, just living a Christian life there in school. What about getting a job or making money? 
you know, we got to work and we got to make a living here. It's just the way life is. But do you know you can work to God's glory as well? You don't have to work for the man. You can work for God. Work for God in your workplace. Shine brightly in your workplace. Love and serve other people. Take out the trash for them. Take them out to lunch. Shine brightly in there. You can actually smile and be cheerful in your job and your workplace. Whatever you do, what do you do? You can do it for God's glory. Really, everything can... You you have to get creative. You have to figure out a way. I'll never forget Mr. J. He was a teacher, my geometry teacher in high school. You know what he did? He couldn't preach the gospel in school. And so he would take quotes of great men and women of the past who spoke about the Bible, and he would say, this great person said once, and he would write it on the board. And they're talking about God and the Bible. And it was his sneaky way in his realm, in his world, to get across the gospel and the message of Christ. Let me ask you this. How are you going to do that in your life? What does that look like for you? Let your light so shine before men and women they'd see your good works and glorify your God who is in heaven. What about making money? Money is the root of all evil. No, that's not what the Bible says. The love of money is the root of all evil. Greed. I tell young people, make lots of money, please. Work hard, figure out how to make money and do it, and then fund the kingdom of God. Send missionaries around the world. Buy Bibles for other countries and food and water. Change, help change people. Take care of the families in the church here in L.A., Be aggressive with your finances and being generous. What else is it for? Did you hear about that guy who walked into uh, heaven with gold in his pockets? You remember that? He's got big pockets full of gold. He's like, look at this, Jesus. Look at all my gold that I got. The Lord's like, eh, we walk on that up here. It's just asphalt. Just throw it over there. It's not worth anything. If you don't spend it here on the kingdom, it'll be worthless in eternity. You can send it ahead. Don't store it for yourselves treasure here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. No, Jesus said, store it for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust will never eat away and where thieves will never break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 20. What about finding a spouse? You know you can find a spouse for the glory of God? Yeah, why not? Why not find someone who's a tag team partner for the kingdom for the rest of your life? Someone who's going to push you to love God more, push you to study God's word, push you to worship. That's good. That's a good thing. And Katie and I compliment each other in that. She does a lot more than I do. She is very helpful in keeping me focused and on track, no doubt, for the kingdom of God. What about buying a house? Can you buy a house for God's glory? Of course you can. You're like, I know, I I bought that house on that street and that neighborhood because I like the paint and I like the front yard and the way that it looked and I like these amenities. Wait, hold on. Why, do you know why you really bought that house? Why? God placed you there to love those neighbors. God placed you there to love and serve the people around you. That's really why you're there. You could bring God glory in the neighborhood or the apartment complex that you live in. Love and serve the people around you. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. What about having a family? The main purpose of family is to raise them in the ways of Jesus, to make them disciples. Look, it's great if they get degrees and make money and do all that stuff, but I want them to worship the Lord in the end. That's the most important thing, to raise up those kids in the ways of the Lord, to love and serve them. That's the point of having a family. You can raise kids for God's glory. Grandparents have great impact on their grandkids, don't they? Parents have very little influence, but grandparents, oh man, they they got the special touch. I don't know what it is. Grandma and grandpa come around, it's like, ah, they're so excited. I think it's because they spoil them and they buy them stuff and then they give them back to their parents when they're whiny and out of control, right? The grandparents have a special touch. It's taking their grandchildren and putting them on your knee and telling them about Jesus. Taking them on a ride to go get some ice cream and telling them about Christ about how you love the word of God, leaving a legacy in your family. Legacy, we can do all for the glory of God, even buying a boat and going fishing. What? I'll never forget, a guy who goes to harvest, he bought this, this fishing boat, and I was asking him about, stink, so nice. 
And he took us out there and we'd go fishing. And you know what we'd do out on the boat? We'd fish for sure. But we would worship God and do Bible study. I was like, Kenny, man, this boat is so sick, man. He let me wakeboard out in the ocean. It was crazy. And I remember asking him, I said, you know, Kenny, you ever going to sell this boat? He says, I'm selling it the day that doesn't bring God glory anymore. Things gone. I'm using everything I have for God's glory. This watch, this shirt, that car, anything that I have, if I can use it for God's glory, I'm going to. Legacy, do you see what I'm saying? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you got to do it for God's glory. you got to figure it out. I can't figure everything out in each of your lives, all the practical things, but you got to think it through. You need to pray and seek God. How do I bless you, Lord, in this What does it look like? It looks different for everyone. We don't need to be legalistic. You need to be doing that. You need to be doing this. No. You seek God for yourself and figure out what you're supposed to be doing and then use what you have been given for God's glory. Be a wise steward of it. Amen? Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. That is the key. That is the kicker. You heard me say this before. A car is made to run on gas. You put dirt in the gas tank, it's not going to run. You are made to run on bringing God glory, and if you put that in your life, your car, your heart, your mind will run on all cylinders. You will be blessed, shining for God's glory. You are made to shine for him, not for yourself. You shine for yourself, and you will become sick. Just look at Hollywood. Those who are the most rich and famous become the most sick because they weren't made to do that. It's okay to have wealth. It's okay to have fame. It's okay to have power, but it must be used for God's glory. Amen? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God.